All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, you two, to the next Water Wetlands and Watershed Seminar. Here we are. It is March 27th, 2024, and we'll go ahead and get started. Megan, let me know if and when the YouTube looks good. So today, our next speaker in the Water Wetlands, Water and Watershed Seminar is Dr. Jamela Roth. So Jamela is an NSF postdoctoral research fellow in biology at the University of Florida, Moat Marine Laboratory, and the Florida Oceanographic Society. I think maybe you'll explain a little bit about that when you get started. She's currently working with Dr. Laura Reynolds, Julie Meyer, Ashley Smith, and Lorraine Simpson to investigate interactions between environmental stressors, seagrass genotypes, rhizosphere microbial communities, and seagrass ecosystem functions. She received her PhD in interdisciplinary ecology. Is anyone in here in SNRE? No, no, no. We didn't have any SNRE folks today. Um, and that was just back in 2022. So Jamila, thank you. The floor is yours. Well, thank you for the introduction. I'm excited to be here. Um, so I am currently an NSF postdoc, um, and I have multiple host institutions and multiple mentors. Um, and so I just started that position this month. Um, and for the last year, I've been uh, working at Moat Marine Lab and their Seagrass Ecosystem Research Program. Uh, and so today, I'm excited to talk with you all about some of the research I conducted for my dissertation focused on the effects of environmental change and species richness on seagrass communities. So one more time. Good. Yep. Well, um, so as I'm sure you're aware, multiple stressors are impacting coastal systems, um, and these include increases in nutrients, as well as warming temperatures due to climate change and increases in grazer population um, due to tropicalization. And so tropicalization is the range expansion of tropical species into subtropical and temperate regions due to warming temperatures. So in many subtropical regions worldwide, we're seeing increases in the abundance of herbivores. And so these herbivores are resulting in increased grazing pressures um, in these systems, and it can result in a phase shift from a um, macrophyte dominated system to a barren system. So for example, in the Mediterranean, um, we're seeing increases in herbivorous uh, rabbit fish, and these are resulting in a 60% loss in benthic biomass, and I believe a 40% reduction in species richness. So we're not only losing these macrophytes, we're also losing the valuable ecosystem services that they provide. Um, and so I'm interested in how these multiple stressors will impact coastal ecosystems. And in order to understand their impact, we need to understand interactions among multiple stressors, as well as ecosystem resistance and resilience to these stressors. Um, so seagrasses can serve as a model system for studying the impacts of multiple stressors and for studying resilience. Um, and this is because we already have a baseline understanding of how single stressors will impact seagrasses. Um, and seagrasses have also served as a model system for understanding the role of genetic diversity um, and relationships between genetic diversity and resilience. Um, seagrasses are also really valuable. They provide carbon sequestration. They provide hotspots for denitrification, which removes excess nitrogen from the system. They provide habitat for um, a lot of different animals, and they can also increase water clarity by trapping sediment um, and preventing erosion. And they pr also provide a lot of area for recreation, including fishing and snorkeling. And unfortunately, we are losing all, um, a lot of seagrass worldwide. Um, and since seagrasses are really valuable and threatened, it's important that we um, incorporate positive interactions into management and work to increase seagrass resilience to stressors. Um, additionally, seagrass management requires informed and engaged citizens, and researchers have found that environmental education can increase civic engagement as well as environmentally responsible behaviors and improve academic, emotional, and social skills. Um, so I wanted to engage with local communities and explore using um, seagrass-focused lessons to teach students about seagrasses um, and to help students improve their knowledge related to Florida learning standards. Um, so there are three main themes I'll talk about today. Um, first, I'll talk about how stressors impact seagrass herbivore interactions. 
And then we'll explore how species richness can impact resilience to these stressors in response to disturbances, as well as how uh, species richness impacts ecosystem functions. And then finally, we'll explore using seagrass focused activities as educational tools. And so to answer these three main questions, I have five different research projects. Um, the first two look at the impact of stressors on seagrass communities. Then we'll talk about how species richness impacts resilience and uh, ecosystem functions. And then finally, we'll talk about these seagrass focused interactive activities. Um, and so I'll start by talking about how warming and grazing impact seagrass communities. Um, so uh, as a result of both tropicalization and successful conservation, we're seeing increases in the abundance of manatees, green turtles, and emerald parrotfish right here in the northern Gulf of Mexico. And so these are all seagrass herbivores. And so this is expected to increase the grazing pressure on seagrass in this area, but we're unsure how the seagrass will respond to this increase in grazing pressure. So I wanna look at how warming temperatures combined with um, tropicalization and increased grazing pressure will impact plant herbivore interactions, specifically looking at plant tolerance traits, which can reduce the impact of herbivory on plant fitness. So these include things like compensatory growth, which is rapid regrowth following grazing, along with stored uh, carbohydrates or sugars, which can be also be used to support regrowth following grazing. Um, as well as having higher numbers of leaves per plant. Then I also want to look at plant resistance traits, which influence the taste and texture of the seagrass. Um, and so these influence herbivore feeding behavior and performance. Um, and to look at how warming and grazing impacts seagrass herbivore interactions, we conducted a mesocosm experiment at the Whitney Laboratory in St. Augustine, Florida. And so we collected turtle grass or Thalassia testudinum from um, the Gulf Coast of Florida and planted in, in tank in these tanks shown here. Um, and we conducted a um, four and a half week experiment where we applied a temperature treatment. And in the middle of the experiment, we also applied a grazing treatment. Um, and so at the end of the experiment, we collected all of the seagrass and used these, sea, these seagrass plants in feeding choice trials of sea urchins to see how plant responses impacted herbivore feeding behavior. So we had two different temperatures used in the experiment. The ambient temperature was around 31 degrees Celsius, and then we heated this by around three degrees Celsius to achieve a heated treatment of with an average of 34 degrees Celsius. And so these are pretty warm temperatures, but we did collect um, temperature data from Cedar Key, Florida, and we found that temperatures are already reaching or exceeding these levels in shallow seagrass meadows. Um, and then we applied five different grazing treatments. So unpictured is the control uh, with no grazing. And then we simulated grazing by two different tropical herbivores that are increasing in abundance due to tropicalization. So to simulate green turtle grazing, we use scissors to clip the seagrass. Um, and then to simulate parrotfish grazing, we use a hole punch to make a half moon shaped scar. Um, and then we also added live herbivores. So we added live sea urchins, Lidocinus variegatus, and live amphipods, Amphitholongomana. And we added these for 24 hours and then removed these grazers. Um, and so we did observe grazing by the sea urchins, um, but we did not observe any grazing scars from the amphipod treatment. And so the amplified treated plants are more similar to the control in terms of grazing. Um, and so first I'll go over how the warming and the grazing impacted plant tolerance traits. And so these are really important because they can influence key ecosystem services, including habitat provisioning, carbon sequestration, and sediment stabilization. Um, and since seagrasses form the base of the food web, Changes in seagrass structure and cover can cascade throughout the entire <clears throat> ecosystem. And so um, all of my graphs are set up like this for these results. So on the x-axis, we have the grazing treatment. In blue is the ambient temperature, and in orange is the heated treatment. Um, and we found that warming temperatures resulted in a reduced growth rate for the plants. And this is consistent with other literature that documents a thermal threshold of 33 degrees Celsius for the species. However, we found that um, the grazing treatments did not impact 
the plant growth rate, indicating that the plants are pretty tolerant of these grazers. So even though there is photosynthetic tissue being removed by the grazers, the plants are still able to maintain similar growth rates, which can help them recover from grazing. Um, and just to show you how we measured plant growth rate, great, we made a punch um, right above the meristem to make a scar um, using a needle. And then we looked at how far those um, scars traveled um, in order to look at new biomass. Um, and then we found that warming temperatures also resulted in reduced canopy height, as well as reduced density and reduced number of leaves per plant. And we also found an interaction between temperature and grazing that influenced the number of leaves per plant. Um, so this means that the effect of the grazers depends on the temperature that the plants are experiencing. And um, these results highlight the importance of studying multiple stressors in combination rather than looking at a single stressor in isolation. So Jamila, none of the grazing treatments um, like spurt, sorry, spurred growth, they all, right. it wasn't like a, um, a growth motivator, like sometimes in a terrestrial ecosystem too, yeah? Yeah, um, no, that's a good point. So I found similar uh, growth level, growth rates for all of the grazing treatments, including the control. And so this is um, typical of compensatory growth where they're, able to maintain the same growth rate as the control, even though they have less photosynthetic tissue, but I didn't find over compensatory growth where they are able to like have even faster growth rates. Um, and so finally, um, in terms of tolerance, we looked at um, rhizome non-structural carbohydrates. And so these are sugars that are stored in the plant rhizome, which is the underground stem. Um, and so we found that the turtle grazed plants had lower um, concentrations of these sugars compared to the amphipod treatment, which was more similar to a control. Um, and so this indicates that these turtle grazed plants may be mobilizing the sugars and using them to support this regrowth following disturbances, which is a good strategy for recovering from grazing. Um, however, this also means that now these turtle grazed plants have lower concentrations of these sugars, so they might be less res resilient to future disturbances. Um, so now I want to talk about the plant resistance traits, which are important because they influence herbivore feeding behavior. So we measured the nutrient concentrations in the seagrass leaves. Here we have carbon to phosphorus and carbon to nitrogen. So a lower ratio means that there's higher concentrations of phosphorus or nitrogen, making the plants more nutritious and more desirable to herbivores. And so we found that the turtle grazed plants had reduced carbon to phosphorus ratios um, but the other grazing treatments didn't impact the carbon to phosphorus ratio. And then we found that the turtle, parrotfish, and urchin grazed plants all had reduced carbon to nitrogen ratios. And there was also a trend for reduced carbon to nitrogen ratios under the heated treatment. Um, and so these stressors are making the plants more nutritious, which might mean that they're more desirable um, for the herbivores. And so one reason why these uh, nutrient ratios may be declining under the stressful conditions is because the plants may be losing their older tissue and the um, newer growth has higher nutrient concentrations. Um, and then we measure the toughness of the leaves. And so this is basically the amount of force required to puncture the leaves. And we found that under warmer temperatures, the leaves were less tough. Um, and so this might also be desirable for herbivores since it would be easier for herbivores and especially smaller herbivores to bite through the leaves. Um, and so now that we looked at some of the plant responses to these stressors, I wanted to look at how these plant responses influence herbivore feeding behavior. Um, and there can be feed, uh, feedbacks between feeding behavior and plant responses since Feeding behavior is influenced by plant physical and chemical characteristics, and then grazing pressure also affects these same plant traits. And so we conducted a feeding assay using the plants from the mesocosm experiment and um, sea urchins as the herbivore, and we used plants from the control treatment, the parrotfish graze treatment, and the heated treatment. And we found that the grazing did not influence herbivore feeding behavior, but the temperature treatment did. So here you can see the temperature treatment from the mesocosm on the x-axis and the amount consumed on the y-axis. Um, and the sea urchins cons consumed more of the plants from the heated treatment. However, we're unsure why 
um, whether this preference is due to structure or chemistry, since we found both decreased leaf toughness and changes in leaf tissue nutrients. Um, and it's also possible that there are changes in secondary metabolites, but we were not able to measure that. To clarify, this is yeah. the feeding trial of, um, after they were grown in warm versus not warmed, but not feeding in a warm, so that right. they were in the same temperature setting. Yeah, it was just which how the plants are grown. So you're testing whether they're more palatable or what, or they were more uh, exactly graceable. Yeah, yeah, so I was controlling the differences in the plant. Yeah, but I wasn't um, the the sea urchins not the were not the in the warmer urchins. temperature. Yeah, gotcha. yeah. yeah. Um, no, that's a good point. I mean, that's something that would have been interesting to add as another factor. Yeah, well, did they get lazier or hungrier? Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> thanks. That's great. Um. And so just to summarize the um, findings from this project, we found that warming temperatures impacted both plant tolerance and resistance traits. And we also found that plants grown under warmer temperatures were more susceptible to grazing. Um, however, we found that uh, plants were somewhat tolerant of grazing, exhibiting that compensatory growth. And we found that plants responded different to different, to different grazers. So grazer identity impacted the outcome of the grazing. Um, and so now that we looked at how warming and grazing would together impact seagrass herbivore interactions, I want to shift and look at how phosphorus availability impacts seagrass communities. Um, and so nutrient availability is changing along many coasts in part due to land use changes, including urbanization and agricultural intensification. Um, and along the north central Gulf Coast of Florida, there is a natural gradient in phosphorus availability that's maintained by the local geology of the area. Um, and so there's higher phosphorus further north and lower phosphorus further south. Um, and so this creates the perfect natural laboratory to look at how phosphorus availability impacts coastal communities. And researchers have found that seagrass morphology and invertebrate communities vary along this gradient. Um, and there's also potential differences in ecosystem services as well. And so I wanted to use this gradient to look at seagrass herbivore interactions and specifically testing the resource availability hypothesis. And so this hypothesis predicts that under resource rich conditions, plants would invest less in anti herbivore defenses. Um, because there would be more resources available to support recovery from grazing. And then under resource poor environments, plants would invest more in anti herbivore defenses. Um, and this is because of higher regrowth costs. So to put this in the context of the uh, seagrass growing along the phosphorus gradient, I'm predicting that in low phosphorus environments, the seagrass would have higher anti herbivore defenses. Um, which would deter herbivores and then in high phosphorus environments the plants would invest less in anti-herbivore defenses and be preferred by herbivores. And past research has also found that the plants in the high phosphorus environment have faster growth rates, which also support this hypothesis. And so I had two research questions. I wanted to look at how phosphorus concentration impacts anti-herbivore defenses in Thalassia, and then how on phosphorus availability impacts foraging decisions by multiple herbivores. And so I used three sites along the phosphorus gradient to answer this question. Um, in the north with high phosphorus, there was Crystal River and Humasata. And then in the south with low phosphorus, there was Wikiwachi. And so I measured um, leaf tissue nutrients for seagrass growing in these different locations. And as we predicted, the leaf carbon to phosphorus ratio was lower in Crystal River and Homosassa, indicating that these plants were enriched with phosphorus. And then while there isn't any systematic variation in nitrogen along this gradient, we did find that the carbon to nitrogen ratio was lower in Homosassa. So the plants from Homosassa also had higher nitrogen as well as higher phosphorus. Um, and so we measured multiple anti herbivore defenses. Um, first, I'll talk about physical defenses, so defenses that impact leaf texture. Um, and so we measured specific leaf area, which is the um, surface area per gram dry, dry weight. So a lower specific leaf area means the leaves are thicker and tougher. Um, and so we found that plants from Mikiwachi had lower specific leaf area. Um, shown here, we have the site along the x-axis, 
Um, and then we also found that plants from Mikibachi had higher fiber content than plants from Humasasa. So overall, the plants from Mikibachi had stronger physical defenses as they were thicker and had more fiber, which would make it harder for herbivores to digest and bite these leaves. And then we also measure chemical defenses. So these first five graphs here are different phenolic acids, and then we measured condensed tannins. Um, and so this is pretty busy, but the moral is that the plants from Mikiwachi often had higher concentrations of these secondary metabolites. So in Mikiwachi, there was higher concentrations of gallic acid, vanillic acid, ferulic acid, as well as condensed tannins. Um, so these plants from the low phosphorus site not only had stronger physical defenses, they also had stronger chemical defenses. And then we wanted to see how these differences in leaf traits impacted herbivore feeding decisions. Um, so we conducted feeding trials using both emerald parrotfish, which is one of those tropical herbivores, as well as sea urchins. And we conducted the feeding trials both using fresh seagrass leaves, which is shown in these plots labeled A, and then agar-based seagrass leaves, which is shown in the plots B. Um, and so for the agar-based seagrass leaves, we freeze-dried freeze the plants, ground them, and embedded them in an agar matrix um, that was shaped as artificial seagrass leaves. And so the purpose of this is to remove the impact of um, leaf texture. Um, and so it kind of isolates those differences in chemistry while controlling for differences in texture. And so we found that the parrotfish preferred the plants from Homo sata in both the fresh and agar-based trials. And so these are the plants with a high phosphorus as well as the high nitrogen. And then we found that uh, the sea urchins uh, had a little bit different feeding behavior. So they preferred the plants from Crystal River and Homo sata for the most part while avoiding the plants from Wikiwachi. And so while these two herbivore species differed in their feeding preferences, they both um, consistently avoided the plants from Mikiwachi, which were the most heavily defended. And so uh, overall, we found that plants from the high phosphorus site have lower defenses and were preferred by multiple herbivores. And these findings support predictions from the resource availability hypothesis. Um, we also found that plants from Mikiwachi had the strongest physical and chemical defenses which um, means that we did not observe any trade-offs between physical and chemical defenses. Um, and then we found that the different herbivore species had slightly different feeding preferences, so they might not target the same seagrass patches, which means um, grazing pressure could be spread out and not as damaging to a single, um, single patch of seagrass. And so now from those first two projects, we found that um, warming temperatures, grazing history, and phosphorus all altered plant anti herbivore defenses. And so th these stressors could mediate the impact of tropicalization by changing plant herbivore interactions. Um, we also found that tropical herbivores and the sea urchins had different feeding decisions and that plants responded differently to um, the green turtle grazing compared to the other grazers. Um, and so now that we've looked at how these stressors impact seagrass communities, um, I want to look at how species richness impacts response to these stressors. Um, and so seagrasses have served as a model system for studying genetic diversity with um, researchers finding increases in resilience, resistance, restoration success, and ecosystem functions due to higher genetic diversity. Um, and so in these graphs here, you can see allelic richness, which is a measure of genetic diversity on the x-axis. And with higher allelic richness, we're seeing higher seagrass productivity, higher invertebrate density, and higher seagrass shoot density. And so um, one of the reasons why these uh, genetic diversity can provide these benefits is because the seagrass clones have different traits. And so this means they can draw on different uh, nutrient pools and they will also likely respond differently to disturbances. So um, after a disturbance, if there's a lot of, if there's high genetic diversity, there's higher probability that some of these genotypes will be able to resist and recover from the disturbance. And then these um, less sensitive species or genotypes can compensate for losses in more sensitive genotypes, um, overall increasing stability. And so similar to genetic diversity, Species diversity also increases the variety in seagrass traits. 
And so while it's less studied, we're expecting that seagrass species diversity will provide similar benefits. Um, and so there are multiple co-occurring seagrass species in the Gulf of Florida and the Gulf Coast. And so this makes it an ideal place to look at um, the impact of seagrass species richness. And these seagrass species vary in their life history traits. So we have Holophila, Haliduli, and Syringodium, which are all faster growing, shorter lived species, so more pioneering species. And then we have um, Thalassia, which is a more persistent species, but slower growing and longer lived. Um, and there's also Rufia, but I'm not focusing on it for this project. Um, and so we also expect these species to differ in their response to disturbances. So the pioneer species would have lower resistance, but higher resilience. And then the um, persistent species like Thalassia would have higher resistance, but they're expected to have lower resilience or a slower ability to recover. So after disturbance, we're expecting that different species will have different responses. And then the less impacted species can compensate for losses in sensitive species. Um, and that would increase stability with higher species richness. Um, and so here in this video, you can see a seagrass meadow in Crystal River, Florida. Um, they're really dense and expansive meadows. Um, they support a lot of life. And you can also see multiple co-occurring seagrass species. So this um, circular one that looks more like spaghetti is syringodium, and then these fettuccine looking leaves are Thalassia. And so I wanted to specifically ask, how does response to grazing vary based on seagrass species identity? And then does macrophyte species richness impact resilience following disturbances? Um, and so to answer these questions, we conducted a field experiment in Crystal River, Florida. And so we were using a natural seagrass meadow that varied in species identity and richness, and we were not transplanting any seagrass plants. And so we established small plots that were 15 centimeters by 15 centimeters, and these varied in their species identity and richness. So there were monoculture plots with the three dominant canopy forming species here. And then there are polyculture plots with two species, three species, and four species. And so these polyculture plots could have any of those three um, dominant species. And they could also have Holophila ingomaniae, which is a smaller understory seagrass species, or Calerpa prolifera, which is a rhizophytic macroalgae. Um, and so we paired each of these control plots with a clipped plot where we simulated green turtle grazing, um, clipping the plants to um, two centimeters above the sediment surface. Um, and these paired plots were located within 15 centimeters of each other to account for spatial variability. So you just found, like you just swam around until you yeah. found things that met those criteria. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay. It was a really unique spot <laughs> and perfect for the That's great. experiment, but it was a little bit hard to... To locate all of yeah. them and have it be and five plots of each, right? Yeah, it's amazing. They were they were small, they didn't scare yeah. me. Yeah. Um. So this was a twelve week experiment, and every two weeks we would monitor macrophyte density, um, counting the number of shoots, and we would also apply a grazing treatment. Um, and then for the final four weeks of the experiment, we stopped applying the grazing treatment to look at longer term resilience. Um, we also collected biomass cores at the end of the experiment to look at changes in plant morphology. Um, and so we found that the morphological responses varied by species. So um, in the clipped plots, the Halophila anglomaniae actually exhibited no changes in morphology, um, while Halidulae radii had reductions in plant height, surface area, and leaf width. Um, Syringodium and Thalassia both exhibited reductions in height, surface area, leaf width, and fewer leaves per plant um, due to the grazing treatment at the end of the experiment. And so overall, these longer-lived species like Thalassia and Syringodium were more impacted by the grazing events. Um, and this is what we expected since these are species are expected to have slower recovery from disturbances. And then we also looked at the density of the different species in the plots. So here on the x-axis, we have species richness. On the y-axis, we have log transform density. And then the solid line is the clipped plots, and the dashed lines are the control plots. So we found that halidulae density was not impacted by the grazing treatment, while syringodium density was reduced by around 40%, and velocity density 
was reduced by around 50%. And so grazing, again, had the strongest impact on the density of these longer-lived species, and especially Thalassia. And then we looked at um, the dominance of the different species. So um, the uh, dominance is calculated as the number of, uh, for example, Thalassia shoots divided by the total number of shoots in the plot. And we found that under um, following the, uh, the simulated grazing events, the Thalassia had reduced dominance in the clipped plots. Um, indicating that other species may be compensating for losses in Thalassia. And then Haladuli, when there was high species richness, Haladuli was actually more dominant in the clipped plots. So while following the grazing treatment, Thalassia was increasing, or was following the grazing treatment, Thalassia was decreasing in dominance, but Haladuli was increasing in dominance when there was high species richness. So this indicates that Haladuli may be able to compensate for losses in um, the last year following grazing disturbances. And then finally, we wanted to see how species richness impacted recovery. And so this plot is set up a little different where each point now represents the paired plots. So each point is a pair of plots. Um, and on the y-axis, we have the paired difference in density. So a value of negative 50 would mean that there's a 50% reduction in density due to the clipping treatment. So negative values mean that the um, grazing treatment are reduced is reducing the um, macrophyte density, and then a value of positive fifty would mean that there's a fifty percent more um, macrophyte in the clipped plot compared to the control plot. Um, and so we found that a polynomial regression best fit this data. Um, so after a threshold, there is a positive impact of species richness on recovery. And so if you look at these points that are for plots with more than three species. The clipped plot actually often has um, more shoots than the control plot. And so this might be because smaller plants or smaller species like Haladuli are replacing larger species like Thalassia, resulting in an increase in density. Um, and so overall, we found a positive impact of species richness on um, recovery from grazing disturbance. And so just to summarize, we found that grazing impacts different species differently. And so areas dominated by Thalassia might be more severely impacted by increased grazing pressure, but areas with more species may be better equipped to recover following grazing disturbances. And so overall, these results are important because um, changes in diversity could signal changes in stability. So monitoring programs could document changes in diversity and these could signal um, these could serve as an early warning sign for changes in stability, or they could serve as a trigger for intervention. And so next, I wanted to look at how species richness impacts um, invertebrate density, diversity, and eating decisions. Um, so seagrasses, which serve as the base of an ecosystem, um, can impact the diversity of other trophic levels as well. So plant diversity impacts um, feeding decisions with, um, for example, specialist herbivores might prefer to feed from a monoculture and generalists might prefer a polyculture. And researchers have also found that diverse diets can in increase fitness by um, increasing or maximizing nutritional intake and minimizing um, toxic toxin intake. Um, and then plant diversity can also impact the quality of habitat for other animals. And so I specifically wanted to look at how species richness impacts invertebrate communities. And to look at this, we used a mesh bag shown here to collect samples from different seagrass microhabitats that contained either one seagrass species or two seagrass species. And then we wanted to look at how species richness impacts herbivore feeding decisions. And to answer this question, we conducted feeding trials with the sea urchin Lidocinus variegatus. Um, and using seagrasses um, with, or seagrass options with only one species and seagrass options with multiple species. And so here in these graphs, you can see um, the impact of diversity and season on invertebrate community. On the x-axis, we have the season, and then the gray boxes are samples that had um, two seagrass species, and the white, white boxes are samples with only one seagrass species. And so we found that samples with two seagrass species had 
higher invertebrate diversity as well as higher invertebrate abundance. Um, we also found that plot, uh, samples with two seagrass species had higher seagrass biomass, so this increase in biomass may be driving the increases in diversity and abundance, since more seagrass biomass may mean um, more habitat heterogeneity and more uh, better protection from predators. And then we conducted these feeding choice trials. So here, if you can see, there were two options presented to the sea urchin. One option was one species alone, and the other option was a mixed assemblage that contained the three seagrass species put together. And so we found that the sea urchins preferred the mixed assemblage over both Halidouli and Syringodium monocultures, and they um, exhibited no preference between Thalassia and a mixed species um, assemblage. And so overall, we found that these mixed species assemblages provided a comparable or preferred food choice to a monoculture. Um, and since these herbivores prefer, and well, these mixed species assemblages, as we saw in the last project, would also be more resilient to grazing by herbivores. Um, and then we also found that microhabitats with multiple species supported more abundant and diverse invertebrates. Um, and so this is really important because abundant and diverse invertebrates have been shown to better control algal growth, um, which positively impacts seagrass by allowing more light to reach the seagrass leaves. And so these results show how biodiversity is connected at multiple trophic levels. So having diversity um, for producers also resulted in higher diversity for um, the invertebrates. And then diverse invertebrates also benefit the seagrass, so there can be a little cycle with the feedback loop there. Um, and so overall, we found really positive impacts of species richness, where uh, seagrass species richness increased resilience. It resulted in uh, more abundant and diverse invertebrates and provided a, um, a comparable or preferred food choice for sea urchins. And so finally, I want to look at how seagrass-focused uh, activities can be used as educational tools. And so for this project, we had three main objectives. Um, first, I wanted to increase knowledge of a really widespread coastal system in Florida. So Florida contains the two largest contiguous seagrass meadows in the U.S. And I realized that a lot of students, um, especially in Gainesville, had never seen or heard of seagrasses. So I wanted to share um, my knowledge and excitement about seagrasses with these students. I also wanted to help students learn topics linked to their learning standards and increase excitement and curiosity about science with the hopes of improving science participation. Um, so I went to after school science clubs in Gainesville um, and led a 40 minute lesson. Um, and I gave a survey before and after the lesson to document changes in student understanding. And so for the lesson, I began with a quick discussion of key terms. Um, and I also talked about how humans interact with seagrasses. Then we showed a video of seagrasses so students could visualize them. And I brought in a live sea urchin that the students could feed. Um, and so this directly showed them the transfer of energy from plants to animals. And then finally, I made a snack where I got local mullet and made a dip so students could see that they're really connected to the seagrass ecosystem. Um, and then I had a couple activities. So in the first activity that I provided this blank handout with an outline of a food web and students could draw in the plants and animals that they wanted or they could um, cut out plants and animals from this pre-printed handout. Um, and then there are also spaces for students to draw in arrows showing the direction of energy transfer. And so the purpose of this activity was to help students think about and connect these vocab words to the plants and animals in seagrass meadows and think about um, the transfer of energy between different organisms. And then we had students visualize food web connections using um, yarn. So each student was assigned a different organism, um, and then the students explained how their organisms were, connect were connected and used yarn to make a kind of complex web to visualize the complex interactions in a seagrass meadow. And overall, we found that the students reported enjoying the activities and learning new information. Um, and I can go over some of the results from the studies. So there are a couple topics where students struggled to improve their understanding. So 
Um, the fact that sea grasses are producers was a little tricky, and so I would definitely spend more time on that term in the future. Um, and then students also did not um, improve understanding of the fact that when the ocean gets warmer, the ecosystem can change. So I'd also spend more time uh, talking about the effects of environmental stressors. Um, I found that students already knew that humans can hurt seagrasses and that ecosystems include living and non-living parts. And then there are a number of topics where students improve their understanding. So the students learn that sea urchins are herbivores. They learn that seagrass gets energy from the sun. So even though they weren't um, fully grasping the term producer, they were still understanding the underlying concept. Um, and then students learn that seagrass is found in the ocean and that seagrass ecosystems provide benefits to humans, animals, and the environment. And so I was really excited about this last um, topic since um, it showed that students really understood ecosystem services and they um, and this concept is really important for environmental conservation as well. Um, so overall, we found that seagrasses were an effective tool for teaching students about key learning standards. Um, and so I used these activities for students that range from third to seventh graders, but um, they could be further adapted to uh, meet student need, meet the needs of older students or younger students. Um, and there, in the future, I would focus on discussing the terms producers, ecosystem services, and the impacts of humans on seagrass meadows. Um, and so overall, for this last topic, we found that seagrass-focused activities um, were effective at teaching students about a local ecosystem and for increasing student understanding of their learning standards. Um, and so this work would not have been possible without the help from all of these people and the support from these different organizations. And so I can take any questions. Thank you. Really, really great work. It's, um, I love how you, you know, capped it off with the education mm -hmm. in the school. It's really amazing. So, okay, we'll take questions from YouTube. We have like 20 people streaming on YouTube right now. So I don't know if you put the word out, but you've got a lot of folks out there. Start with questions from the room. I have a, I have a red one. So the short-lived species that you talked about, the diversity, mm -hmm. they were... They responded more. Uh, they responded better because they were able to reproduce better. Okay. Um. Yeah. So that's that's my um thoughts on that. So the the like pioneer species like Halidulli, which are shorter lived, also have faster growth rates. So um they're able to, I think, regrow more quickly after a disturbance. But um it's also important to note this was only a three month experiment, and so. The dynamics could change over longer periods of time. So, for example, the longer lived species like Thalassia have more nutrient and sugar reserves stored under underground. So, um, that could also influence recovery over longer time periods and could promote recovery after more time. So, be interesting to look over longer time periods yeah. too. So, kind of following on that, do you do we know how stable or dynamic if you were to go? every month and look at a patch for years and be like, are we seeing disturbance driven changes in composition that are then sort of this like resilience recovery, resilience recovery, or or is a patch a patch for the most part? Uh-huh. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I think it depends on the location and the species composition a little bit. Um, there has been work by, um, Someone in, who was in my lab, Alex Biak, who found, I think that areas dominated by Thalassia might be more stable over longer periods of time. So I think it depends both on the disturbance regime and the species composition um, and the species identity. But this is an area, the, the area where I conducted the experiment in Crystal River has a lot of um, scars in the meadow from boat propellers. So I think that would cause turnover in species and those areas might be more rapidly colonized by um, those early successional species like Halidulia. And so that would cause turnover in, and changes in the stability of those systems. Zoom and YouTube, questions from y'all? I 
What a school did you go to here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, where'd you go? Um, so I was working with the Cultural Arts Coalition. Um, and so there are a couple, there are a number. Um, they have their own science club that's over just north of campus a little bit. And then I went to the Sharing and Caring School. Mm -hmm. And I went to the Boys and Girls Club. Um, and I think there are others too, but I'd have to look. Yeah, but what's the Sharing Club? I can't share. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I think my the one north of campus is Parker Elementary. Did you go over there? I didn't. I'm just thinking it's the it's not a school, it's the Wilhelmina Johnson oh, Center. Center. Uh -huh. yeah. They have their own little science club. Excellent. But I know the UF Club Nerdy does a lot of work with these organizations, so it's a good way to connect with the community. It's fun. Ashley, go ahead, unmute. You can ask your question. Thanks. So it's not a super scientific question, but I'm kind of curious. What got you interested in seagrasses specifically as an as a he phrase it as a model of ecosystem health? Um, sort of interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a good question. Um, so I kind of happened upon seagrasses a little bit after undergrad. I really wanted to study aquatic systems and coastal systems. And so um, I think seagrasses drew me in because they're so important and um, widespread, especially in Florida. And so um, and so I came to the University of Florida and I that's kind of how I got interested in seagrasses. And then this is a pretty unique area in the US since there's so such high species richness and since there's this tropicalization occurring with increases in grazing. Um, and so it seemed like the perfect spot to study um, impacts of stressors and mechanisms for increasing resilience, including species richness as a mechanism. Thank you. Great. We have a question from YouTube from Jackson Heitman. So uh, Jackson says, great talk. Uh, curious about how nutrient availability is predicted to change, especially with anthropogenic, um, potentially increasing nutrient availability and increasing perhaps herbivore or uh, uh, interactions. So, Cool. Um, yeah, so I think in general, we're expecting to see increases in nutrients, and we're already seeing that in a lot of areas, just due to um, increases in or population growth in coastal areas. Um, and so these increased nutrients, seagrasses can often um, deal with some increases in nutrients, but then if they get too high, it can um, even trigger alternative stable states or cause a shift from a seagrass dominated system to a macroalgal dominated system. So seagrasses um, or when nutrients get really high, this can cause algal blooms, which block the light from the seagrass. Um, and then as seagrasses die, they're no longer providing these valuable functions like trapping the sediment and um, this can kind of cause a shift over, or this can uh, pass a threshold, and then the seagrasses are not able to recover and it can shift to a macroalgal dominated state. Um, and so it is interesting to think about how that will interact with changes in the grazer community. Um, and um, it's interesting to look at how. Um, communities vary between macroalgae and seagrass dominated ecosystems to see if that will changes in the type of macrophytes will translate and impact other um, trophic levels as well. All right, well, let's give one more round of applause to Dr. Roth. Thank you, Jamal, so much. And we will see you all next week. Uh, thanks, YouTube. Thanks, Sam. Have a great wet afternoon. We'll see you later.